Okay, so we are now recording. So once again, welcome to uh, our Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES Professional Learning on the Go Telehealth Basics uh, for Mental Health. Um, I am Dr. Andrew Ecker. I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Dr. Deselia Lopez. And we are um, very happy to be sharing um, with you all today. Uh, just a little bit on uh, the Guidance and Child Study Center, PNW BOCES. Um, we exist to um, improve the lives of kids who are the most vulnerable and kids who are marginalized. Um, and mental health plays a big role in that. Um, obviously, during this time, we want to continue um, to support and improve the lives of kids who are the most vulnerable. Um, and we are doing that today um, through a very exciting topic of telehealth, which I think is um, a tool that uh, when used appropriately, um, allows us to improve access and opportunities for kids who um, might not have had services um, as they had before. Um, I want to share that at the bottom of um, the screen, there is a link for resources on our homepage as well as other professional learning opportunities. Um, at the end of um, this workshop, you can enter your email into um, our group chat and we're happy to send you this PowerPoint as well as all the links and the resources. Um, these will also be posted um, on my Twitter, which I know is not the best way to reach everyone, but the link um, for my Twitter is there as well. So we want to make sure that you have everything from this. We will email it out. You can find it posted. It'll be on our website. Um, and like I said, there's lots of resources in here that we want to share with everyone. So a bit of our agenda for today, we want to start with some welcome and some introductions. Um, it's also really important that we have some norms and uh, disclaimers for this type of workshop. Um, we'll talk a little bit about self-care and give a big thank you. Um, then we're going to get into the telehealth basics, share some resources, and um, if we have time, um, share some bright spots, um, questions and answer, and next steps. And as I mentioned previously, uh, tomorrow at the same time, 3 o'clock, Dr. Lopez will be leading our clinical forum. And perhaps if we run out of time today, we can have a continued uh, talk and sharing a Bright Spots Q&A around this topic um, in that forum tomorrow. Um, so a couple of things around norms and our disclaimers, as I mentioned, um, everyone is muted to start. That is because this is being recorded so that we can share this with others in the field. And we encourage you to share this with others as well. Um, something else that's important to know is that this information is the best that we know at this moment. Um, we acknowledge that um, we are in a pandemic, and that this is a really difficult time, and that we are all doing our best um, for our students, um, for ourselves, for our kids, for our families, um, and we just want to share the best information that we have at this time. Um, that said, we are not state or federal authorities by any means. We are not attorneys. Um, we're doing the best that we can, so we hope that we are able to share things with you that you find useful, but um, again, if you have any questions about um, anything, you should always check with um, either supervisors or uh, attorneys or someone like that. So quick um, check-in on self-care. Um, we believe very much in self-care, and I think that as people in um, the service industry and people who help others, um, it can often go to a secondary or even further down the list of things that we're looking out for. So um, when we share these resources, we want to share um, some things where you can actually um, go deeper into your own self-care. Uh, we talk about the ABCs of wellness, things that we can do for awareness of our emotions, of how we're feeling, um, things around stress, vulnerability, um, change, loss, um, economic hardships, um, good feelings, positive things. We always want to be aware. Uh, we want to do our best to maintain balance across everything that we're doing in our lives um, and to also have connections. So we appreciate uh, greatly that you are connecting um, with us today, and we hope to be a source for you to connect going further as well. We always want to share resources um, for you as well for others who might be in crisis. Um, we know that um, the um, Suicide Prevention Lifeline is available um, in English as well as in Spanish, and we always want to encourage um, you or anyone who needs help to reach out to the um, appropriate people. Lastly, or as we get to the important thank you, 
to all of you. Um, you know that this is just an incredibly difficult time and that you are taking on so much um, in terms of your work. The fact that you are here today means that in the midst of um, this pandemic that you are um, reaching out to learn more, to see how you can better support your students, your loved ones, and those who you um, serve. So um, a huge thank you for all that you do. Um, and also this as well as much of our work would not be possible with all the resources that we have. Um, the resources that we're sharing today are largely from the Technology Transfer Center, which is funded by SAMHSA, um, as well as from NASP. And um, if anything is not cited or referenced, we just wanna give a big thank you to everyone and um, hopefully we won't get sued for anything that we're sharing today, but it's all to improve the lives of kids and those who are most vulnerable. So um, we really thank everyone for sharing all, all of their resources, um, especially across the internet for free, um, which helps us to improve the lives of kids. Okay, so jumping right into teleconferencing. Um, before we get to telehealth, I think it helps uh, to step back and to think about teleconferencing and the purpose for this. Um, the fact that we are teleconferencing today, um, we know some of the benefits of it and why we might use it. And certainly in the last month has jumped to uh, the forefront of something that's on my mind. Um, we know that we're using it for meetings. It is probably the primary um, modality for teaching right now. We have webinars such as this. We can consult with other professionals. Um, and it can also be beneficial for clinical supervision, training, fidelity monitoring, visitation, and patient care. So I think it's good to step back, but before we think about telehealth, we can ground this in teleconferencing in general. So what is telehealth? We know that it is the use of technology to provide healthcare when providers are geographically distant from patients that the transmission of images, voice, and data between two health units via technology to provide educational, clinical training, administrative, and consultation services. And that this is a broad term that applies to healthcare delivered using telecommunications technology or technology-enabled health. So some services that are provided via telehealth and that you might be thinking about right now for yourselves or your own school are live video conferencing. So this is synchronous. This is when you have the provider to the patient or provider to, to another pro provider. Um, another form is asynchronous, which is when we would store and forward. An example of an asynchronous um, service would be that if we were to record this for someone else or if you were to uh, uh, tape strategies and then send them to a patient that they could access later on. Um, this is important for remote patient monitoring as well as mobile health. So some benefits that uh, we know from telehealth is that it increases the access to quality healthcare. There are cost efficiencies. Um, there's research supported outcomes and satisfaction. There's certainly consumer demand for it, especially right now. And uh, there are technology platforms that while this says that they are easy to use, I would say that they are usable and that we can learn to use them better. Um, I also wanna reference at the bottom of these slides, there are some resources um, that will be available. Uh, this one is from the American Telemedicine Association. And all of these will be shared um, with you and you know, absolutely track us down. Uh, we will try our best to send them out to you and if we miss you, um, then they'll be posted in multiple places. So now let's talk about specific to our time right now and during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we are connecting with clients and other colleagues who are quarantined. Um, we are all doing this right now. Um, some benefits is that this is allowing staff to work from home and that it provides rapid access to behavioral health for those who have significant life changes. So when we think about people who have lost their employment, domestic abuse, um, virtual education, um, this is allowing us to reach clients and students in ways that just even a few weeks ago, um, that, that wasn't possible to do. However, of course, with anything, there are some challenges to this. Um, however, we, we believe that most of the time the benefits out, outweigh the challenges. Um, we need patient access to appropriate technology. So when we think about um, reaching our students, do they have um, internet accessibility for the providers and, and the professionals? Have they adopted telehealth practices in the past? As we know, we're in education as well as in mental health. We're asking people who have um, mastered practices that take years of mastery to learn to 
um, really change on a dime and to try something that is very, very new. Um, we know that not all patients are appropriate for telehealth. Um, there are also privacy challenges, and in some cases, there can be um, billing issues as well. So what are some strategies? Um, one way we can do it is to plan ahead. So thinking about who will champion the telehealth effort. Um, why does your organization want to provide telehealth? Um, what additional services and equipment are needed? Where are your partners? And will you receive or, or will you provide services? And then knowing these elements, this will help you determine how you move forward. So um, the hope is that you are never going alone. Um, if you are a sole provider and you're thinking about telehealth, um, you know, feel free to um, join one of our clinical forums. That might be a chance where we can share these things, but uh, we wanna try to think about planning ahead before we jump into a practice, especially around something um, like mental health. So some steps to utilizing telehealth, and again, I'm going very quickly, but I want you to know that at the bottom of these slides that you will have, there are resources at the bottom that speak directly to each of these. So some steps to utilizing telehealth, things like uh, clinical considerations. Um, we all have different licensing bodies, um, and um, we wanna know the considerations of both our profession as well as our state or our, our, our um, school system. Um, technical considerations, and then licensure legal and administrative considerations. So getting into some um, clinical considerations. So a huge um, consideration is our professional and patient identity information. Um, we need to know the appropriateness of the telehealth services. We always need informed consent. Um, the physical environment of the setting, both for ourselves as a provider, as well as for the patient or the student. Um, communication and also collaboration with the treatment team. So hopefully none of this is happening in isolation. And even though you might be um, providing um, services remotely, I hope that you still have an opportunity to collaborate with the treatment team. So it's important to think about what are best practices if we were face-to-face, -face, and then how might we replicate those if we were gonna work virtually. Um, emergency management. So a big thing to think about is um, protocols that we have in place in case there's a disclosure of an emergency or something that rises to the level where um, it is an urgent issue, um, other medical issues, and other re uh, referral resources. So as I said, the, uh, the patient identity information, we need to be thinking about where will the patient receive services, uh, where will a clinician provide them? So what is your location like? Do we know what, what we can control about um, the patient who's receiving them? Um, will, will there be assistance to the patient? So if you are working with young kids, is there someone there who can help them either with technology or someone um, that uh, uh, you know is, is going to ensure a confidential environment? Um, when we think about the appropriateness for telehealth services, um, I would think that you know, most patients can benefit from services via telehealth, but we always need to evaluate the patient risk factors and the accessibility to the telehealth technology and also develop an emergency plan. Of course, informed consent must be initiated during or, or before uh, the first telehealth visit in real time. Um, state and federal laws regulate verbal and written consent. Um, as well as the document consent. Um, and you should include similar in-person elements and add elements specific to telehealth and video conferencing. Um, I think all of these are really important. I know that um, across mental health, including special education, and um, we know that during this time, there are things that are changing quickly. However, we always wanna um, ensure the um, rights of our students, of our patients, of our clients, um, and even though something might look different um, because we're doing it virtually, that uh, we are still ensuring that the function is there and that their rights are always ensured. So I won't go through all these, but there are different consents for services. Um, in terms of telehealth, we want to limit the confidentiality in the electronic communication. Um, these are things that are changing every day in terms of things like Zoom um, and other um, 
platforms that people might, might use. Um, we need a process to document and store patient information. Um, if you're working in a school in a typical setting, um, you might know when someone comes and goes from your office and when the meeting began and ended. However, if someone is working remotely, um, it's important to know that you know, there was a beginning to a meeting and end of it and that you have notes to support this. Um, other people should know um, what the schedule is, um, potential for technical failures that everyone knows, both the provider as well as the patient or the client, um, what, what, what to do um, in, in case of a technical issue. Um, anything that you can think of probably will happen in terms of tech issues. Um, protocol for contact be between sessions. Uh, if you think about a Zoom link that you are sharing with one of your patients, um, that might be something that they could potentially access between meetings. So we wanna ensure that um, just because you could access something um, that you have the protocols for when and how to access them. Um, and that you also have conditions for termination. So some more clinical considerations around the physical environment. Um, remember, we are, I'm working from home right now. This is very different than my office, but we still wanna aim for professional and also comparable in-person treatment. So we want this to be as much like it would be um, things to uh, think about your seating and lighting. Um, I'm sitting in front of a window right now, so I hope that you can see me in the slides, but um, the camera should be secure based on your eyes and face so that you are visible. Um, it's always great to do test runs that so you can see what this looks like from someone else's perspective. Um, even things like clothes and things like that can cause uh, re a uh, reflection or change in the light. As you mentioned, the clinical considerations, um, we wanna make sure that you're communicating, also collaborating with your treatment team. That there's emergency management in place um, and protocols for medical issues and also referral resources. I'm gonna pause there and ask Dr. Lopez if you have any um, things to add or comments around the clinical considerations. I hope I didn't mute Dr. Lopez. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. I apologize if I muted you, Celia. That was unintentional, and that's part of the technical considerations to consider going forward. So you should know your video conferencing applications. I am learning Zoom on the fly and clearly far from mastery of that. Um, you need to know about your device characteristics, connectivity, privacy issues. Um, and think about the different ways to connect and always thinking from the perspective of your student, of your patient or client, um, what works best for them? Um, is it something that is natural for them? If it's trying to master a new technology that might impact uh, fidelity of the treatment. So we wanna make sure that we can control for as much as we can in terms of the technology so that the uh, treatment can go as smoothly as possible. So some things about our devices that we would think about here. And important things, whoops, about video conferencing applications. Sorry about that. Um, we need to ensure appropriate confidentiality for HIPAA um, and security considerations. Uh, we know that there have been some issues with things like Zoom, but we hope that those are being um, addressed. Um, one of those features was like adding the waiting room, which is something that was not on this account last week, um, but now we're able to do. Um, and also to have different functions. So to know if you have comments that you can limit number of uh, participants, recording meetings, document sharing. Um, my biggest tip, again, I'm learning on the go with all of this is to practice. Practice with a colleague in a controlled situation um, so you can try anything that you would need to do during the meeting, try it in advance. Um, I am a basketball player and something that we would always um, say is that if you can't do it in practice, you can't do it during a game. So I would encourage everyone to practice everything that you need to do um, around telehealth before doing so. So other considerations um, are around connectivity. Um, we mentioned privacy. And then some considerations around license or legal and administrative considerations. 
So we need to know the qualifications and training of providers and the licensure laws in your organization and in your state. Um, we always want to keep records. So scheduling, emailing, um, time in, time out of meetings, um, documentation and record keeping. It's also really important to make sure that when you end a meeting that you are really ending the meeting. So you can disconnect, make sure that your uh, recording light is turned off, that there's no more sound, um, and keep track of any privacy and safety things that you need to. Um, it might, be, um, might seem to be more casual if you're in a home or you have conversations where people are seeing things about um, your house or your dog that pops up, um, but you always want to ensure the privacy and safety of the provider and therapist yourself as well. So um, in terms of qualifications and training of uh, providers, this is one of those things that is changing in the moment. Um, we are all here today learning. Um, so there's guidance and there's lots of resources at the end of this PowerPoint that will be shared. Um, so a lot of the qualifications are more informal. It's around comfort, it's around connectivity, but you always need to make sure that you are within the parameters of your uh, licensure, of your school district, and your organization, state, and um, that the patient's family, everyone knows uh, what those terms are. So again, we've talked about um, Zoom as one platform, the clinical considerations, technical considerations, licensure, administrative, and again, um, practice, practice, practice. Um, I would try to think through some of the issues that you might encounter, um, practice them, work through anything, make sure that it's clear um, before setting up any um, actual telehealth practices. So again, I'm pretty sure that you cannot access these now, but I promise you will be able to in a little bit. Um, there are some how-tos here. Um, Zoom has great support. Um, I try to use it as much as I can because I have a long way to go, but um, you can find Zoom resources here. Oops, sorry about that. And there will be additional resources at the end. Okay, so that was from our Technology Transfer Center. And these are some tips from NASP. Um, this is kind of like a step-by-step -step guide um, that's been shared by NASP. So uh, great thanks to NASP for this. Um, but in terms of the five steps of one, considering your virtual environment, two, communicating with others to plan a response to student need, um, step three, consider the breadth of services. Step four, consider legal and ethical issues. And step five, embrace people and NASP as resources. So I hope that um, all of these should be seen as complementary. Uh, we just wanted to present um, a few different resources. So while these might be different in terms of the language, they are totally consistent in the practice. So some key messages from NASP um, is always refer back to the NASP practice model to be your guide and consider how your telehealth work today can support prevention, the evaluation and intervention services for tomorrow. And um, I really like this because um, it really reminds me that the platform might have changed, but what we know to be best practice and what we know to be effective for kids stays the same. Um, this is an opportunity for you to demonstrate your value beyond what they already know about you. So um, great heads up that if you um, are looking to become an expert in a new field, this is it, and this is your great time. Uh, be thoughtful about your virtual environment. Technology offers ways that you can, you can connect with your colleagues, school administrators, parents and kids, um, reach out and touch them one. So I think um, this is great. It's encouraged me to sort of take the first step. Um, couple weeks ago. Well, I still am very, very nervous about uh, presenting through this platform, but um, I'm getting better. So I encourage you to uh, take the chance and to reach out and to test someone um, through um, technology in a helpful way. Um, prioritize student needs. So weigh the risks and benefits of services. Consider compensatory services as needed. Communicate and coordinate regularly with colleagues, teachers, parents, and your students. Use a legal and ethical decision-making model to guide your work. Consider your skills and seek out related professional development as needed. 
I think this is um, an important one is I've attended uh, some trainings recently on um, telehealth. This is a great reminder to um, you know that we can only try so many new things at one time. So I would say that for telehealth practices, this is um, we're putting a lot of energy into learning um, something that's new. So um, it might be a good time to stick to something that we know pretty well in terms of the evaluation or the intervention um, that we are providing while using telehealth. Um, utilize NASP and external resources in supporting the work of your school community. So thank you for um, looking to us for your help at PNW BOCES, and I hope that uh, we can um, share some resources today as well as tomorrow afternoon through our forum. Um, internship and practicum students should work closely with your grad educators and site supervisors to stay engaged with students and teachers. Okay, so there's some additional NASP resources here, um, health crisis resources, um, a NASP virtual service delivery in uh, response to COVID-19 disruptions. Here's the NASP guidance for uh, delivery of school psychological telehealth services. Um, and just to click away, virtual school psychologists or hire. Further resources, I won't go through all of these, but we have things from the American Psychological Association, uh, from ASCA for school counselors, um, guidance from the U.S. Department of Education on FERPA and virtual learning, and U.S. Department of Health and Human Services on uh, telehealth remote communications. And then lastly, going back to some other resources from the American Telemedicine Association, from SAMHSA, and the International Society for Mental Health Online. So I'm speeding through these, but once we share them with you, I hope that you find them helpful. Okay, so I'm going to pause here for a moment. I'm going to, um, we want to have an opportunity to connect with each other. I'm gonna see if I can unmute. So just please bear with me for a moment. So if I unmute everyone, I'm just gonna ask that you please re-mute yourself, except for if you are the person who is speaking. So I hope that everyone is unmuted now and that if you could um, mute yourself unless you are speaking. You might hear a lot more background noise. But I'm going to say hello to Dr. Lopez. I'm sorry that I muted you the entire time. I've been speaking for That's about okay. 30 minutes straight, so I'm going to ask um, for you to um, Share and, and you know what? If, if you'd like, if you can remember any of the slides, I can share them again and go hear back, me? Uh, reference them at this point. It's so, so weird. I yeah, hear like static, like yes. Yeah, so, um, thank you, Andrew. I just wanted to say, in terms of um, the different platforms and making sure that you know what your own um, organization is saying about telehealth practice that you need to make sure that you again um, are both comfortable with the therapeutic approach and also with the technology that you're using and that you also follow the ethical and legal guidelines around telehealth services along with the other guidelines that we mentioned including um, assessing the student's need and seeing what is um, helpful and applicable for them, specifically for students who may be um, more behaviorally inclined, you know, there's uh, those clinical implications, or um, students who are more severely disabled who may not be able to appropriately access um, the technology without additional support. So um, these 
um, kind of decisions are being made in school districts right now in consultation with the clinical staff in consultation with the administration and legal guidance as well in, in, in districts. So I just wanted to clarify that I would not encourage anyone to make this decision on their own, um, but to make sure that you are versed in all the areas and then have some consultation with your administration and your legal team. Thank you very much. So um, we had posed a few sort of wrap up comments around um, bright spots, um, questions and answers and um, next steps. So I just wanted to open it up. I hope that this time um, you can either use the chat or if you can unmute yourself, you can try our best to manage the conversation virtually. But if anyone um, first wants to share any bright spots, so things that um, are going well for you in your practice um, with telehealth or some things that you might have learned about that you wanted to share with us today. So again, if you want to unmute yourself, we can try our best to manage, um, or you can put them into the group chat. Also, if you have any questions um, for Dr. Lopez, for myself, please feel free to put them into the group chat as well. So are there any bright spots or questions that you want to share? Okay, so it seems like we are, um, there are not any questions at this time, but what I think we can do is um, as a wrap up, what I would ask is um, if you could leave your email in the group chat, and I hope that you could um, message me directly. Um, if you'd like the resources sent to you, you can do it that way. Um, if not, I'm going to, um, if you would prefer to just access them, um, I will post them on Twitter and I will write my Twitter handle in here and I will share them um, probably within the next hour or so. I see and there is um, a comment by Paul. Hi, Paul. How are you? <laughs> nice seeing you. Um, it states, I am interested in seeing how this will work for my students since they have experienced a lot of trauma. Um, and that is a very complex question at the time that we're in, knowing that we're in a pandemic. So um, not only has they possibly, we have know of students who have a history of, of trauma culminating to what's happening now, but many students, um, schools have been their safe space and their only safe place. And so we do worry about that. We worry about um, the repercussions of all this enclosure of being um, socially isolated. Um, and so it's something that is always, I know for me personally in the back of my mind in terms of moving forward, um, and I think a lot of districts right now, what you're doing is um, making sure that they have therapists or clinicians touching base with a lot of the students. I know that some districts in this area have done that blanketly in terms of making sure that one um, person is connected with one with every single child and then having protocols in place if they're not connecting with a specific, a specific student. Um, I know that a district P skill right now is having um, kind of clinicians on call on a rotating basis. So I know that there are some protocols and procedures in place with local school district. However, it is you know um, something for all of us to be thinking about post um, epidemic in terms of the repercussions of all this for all our families, but specifically for those students who have a history of trauma and may be in unsafe conditions at the moment. So thank you for that. 
Yeah, thanks. So I just want to add that's something that I know we've been talking a lot and it's come up in a lot of different forums, especially as domestic abuse rises. Um, we know that substance abuse, um, there's all these things that can be um, triggers for those things and that um, how do we reach out um, to students or to those who might be victims during that time. So the things that we talked about around telehealth practice today, these are sort of like, you know, best case scenario, like everything is set up. We have time to set up a computer and a laptop and the internet works and um, everyone speaks the same language and we can do all these things, but um, obviously we know that the real conditions are much more challenging than that. So I think that that's um, really, I think the next step for myself, I know, and um, I look forward to learning more um, together um, on those topics going forward. And Paul also mentioned um, children who are in facilities where they can't get visits right now as well because of um, just the situation you're in. So yeah, it's, it's quite difficult. Um, and I'm not sure how those, if they're having some um, connection with their families face to face, Paul, do you want to add something to that? Oh, can Paul be unmuted? Sorry, yeah, I tried to yeah, unmute no, Paul there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Getting used to Zoom technology like you guys are, of course. Um, so right now we're trying to, you know, have the, the cottage staff, which is actually staying on campus, do like activities, you know, like barbecues, basketball games and such. And Dr. Lopez, to answer your question, I know they get phone calls with their parents or legal guardians. And I know that the community workers, you know, they're like the liaisons, have been trying to like um, get them in touch with uh, other folks like grandma, grandpa, if they have any relatives that... Uh, you know, have legal contact with the students. Um, it's just a bit challenging, you know, since every child is different on that part. Okay, great. Thank you, Paul, for sharing. Thank you for that advice. Um, so if you have a question, you can also put your name in the box and then I can unmute you. This is just another workaround. Again, I apologize for the, my basic Zoom knowledge here. We're happy Valerie to. Valerie Fazio had a bright spot that she wanted oh, to share. Me... I'm not sure. John? Valerie, I tried to unmute you. And... Can you hear me? Oh, I can, yes. Okay, so I'm an aide from Pinesbridge School. And um, I just, I like checking into these different um, virtual workshops. Um, not that it can really help me in my job, but just to see what's out there. And I just think it's so wonderful how everybody is working so hard to help all these children that a lot of people don't realize these kids have a tough life. And usually when they come to school, that's their safe zone. So that we're able to still help them even though they're not in their safe zone, I really applaud all of you on how hard you're working. Thank you, Valerie, and thank you for um, all that you do um, for kids, and I totally agree with you. Um, and I really appreciate um, your sentiment there around, you know, and I think this speaks just to the value of educators to school, to, school, to, uh, clin to clinicians and um, the impact of your work, which is that right now we, trying to recreate something in a really novel way during the most difficult time um, and these are the most challenging jobs you know on a on our best day so um, thank you um, for this pain today thank you for being here and thanks for um, joining and for all you do for kids anyone else so um, before we wrap up, I just want to kind of share some next steps. Um, thank you to those who are putting um, your email in the chat. You can uh, send your email to the group if you'd like, or you can also just message me um, if, if you don't want to share your email, which is fine. Um, I will post these resources um, to Twitter as well. Again, the PowerPoint embedded in it are lots of links and resources, and we encourage you to share widely. Um, this would not be possible without organizations like NASP and the Technology Transfer Center. So um, thank you to them for sharing all of their materials with us. Um, something on a schedule, just so you know, um, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Um, on Wednesday, April 8th, we're going to be having a virtual CODA celebration for 
co-occurring disorders awareness. Um, so this would this is Code a Week, and Stephanie Marquesano, who is uh, the founder of the Harris Project, and I will be facilitating um, with the same link um, a Zoom meeting on a virtual Coda celebration. So we'll have resources, and that will also be uh, uh, recorded. So if you're not able to make it, we can share that later. Um, and then at three o'clock tomorrow, again with the same link, uh, Dr. Lopez will be leading our clinical, our, our school clinicians forum. Um, so we hope that you can join us for these. Um, and anything else going forward, uh, Dr. Lopez? Anything that uh, you'd like to add before we wrap up? No, I just want to say um, thank you, everyone, and and I just want to echo Dr. Andrews' um, sentiment about all the work and the collaboration um, that people are being engaged in during these most difficult times for all of us. So thank you for being here with us and giving us some of your time and please be well and um, take care of yourselves. Thank you. And again, thank all of you. Um, hope that everyone takes time for self-care and enjoys um, what is an important week. Um, for many in terms of holidays and things like that, and that you all stay safe and stay well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.